This is CBC Here and Now. It's the machine taking control of a person. Deceptive, addictive, and damaging. He hoped to take his fight against VLTs to the Supreme Court of Canada, and he wasn't alone. Upwards of 30,000 people from this province joined him. A lot of money, but a lot of jobs. A lot of families attached to the forestry uh, industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. This old human resources building from the mill is getting a huge makeover. It's going to be a new training and research center in the heart of Corner Brook. I'll explain. The humidity returns for some of us tomorrow. I'll have your full forecast coming up. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Indigenous people in Labrador say they're being treated unfairly in RCMP news releases. A CBC review found that Innu and Inuit were overrepresented among the people named in press releases over a three month period. Just let have a look at the numbers here. RCMP issued 85 press releases between May 1st and July 24th. In Indigenous communities, the accused was named 88% of the time. In non-Indigenous communities, just 26% of alleged perpetrators were named. My first reaction certainly was disturbing when I read the, uh, the article. Uh, so I've reached out to Justice and Public Safety, working with, of course, with the RCMP to do their own analysis and response to this. You know, it's important now that everyone gets fair treatment, but it's important too that everyone gets equal treatment when you enter the justice system. So we need to do some work on this. So I've asked Justice and Public Safety to do an analysis and of course work closely with law enforcement like RCMP to, uh, to get some answers to this report that we read this morning. Now, the RCMP says race is not a factor when police release the name of the accused. Later in the show, we'll hear from Jody Ashini of the Sheshashi Innu First Nation, who says Indigenous people are more often unfairly named in RCMP press releases. Well, the legal fight over the future rights of one indigenous group in Labrador is growing. Nunatuavut and the federal government are negotiating a deal similar to a land claim, but the Nunatsiavut government is raising concerns. Here and now, Peter Cowan has been looking into the story for us tonight. So, Peter, what can you explain? What can you tell us about this fight? Right, so Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut are separate Inuit organizations. They represent different people in different areas but they have some overlapping areas and that's why Nunatsiavut now wants to get involved in this legal fight. It's worried that the federal government negotiating with a new group for new rights could impact them. Last fall, the federal government and Nunatuavut signed an agreement. They're working towards recognizing the Inuit group's rights and lands within Labrador. It was a big step for the group, which was formerly known as the Labrador Métis Nation. But other indigenous groups worry it could be a step back for them. Uh, we were as surprised as anyone else. Um, again, we had no uh, indication that this was the direction that the government of Canada was in at that particular um, uh, point in time. So again, we haven't really had the time or the space to um, consider that. Nunatuavut claims most of southern Labrador as its traditional territory. A final agreement will almost certainly be smaller. But the proposed area conflicts with the land claim the Innu already have, as well as Nunatsiavut. Nunatsiavut wants to intervene in the court case already launched by the Innu nation. And the Innu are questioning whether Nunatuavut should even be considered indigenous. Now here we are in a very unusual circumstance. Settlers becoming Métis, becoming Inuit, and now are, go are going to fight us over land. In the past, Nunatsiavut has been very careful not to take a position on this issue, and they aren't about to now. They don't feel that it's a legitimate indigenous group. What's your view on this? I'm not going to comment on that. Um, again, the reason for us intervening is very specific. And that reason is they want to make sure that if there's a court battle that could affect the rights of Nunatsiavut, that they're going to be at the table. But what about Nunatuavut? What are they saying about this development? Well, I reached out to them today. They said they're still reviewing this, and they hope to say more in the coming days. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's here now's Peter Cowan reporting live. 
Well, a long court battle against video lottery terminals has come to an end. Last week, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that a lawsuit which calls VLTs deceptive and addictive will not proceed. More than 30,000 people in this province were members of the class action that began almost a decade ago. Here, Nazmar Quinn spoke with one member who hopes the province will get rid of the machines anyway. Throw them out in the harbor. <laughs> Doug Babstock knows what he'd like to see happen to VLTs. He says he joined the class action to shut them down because he has no doubt that these machines are addictive. Oh, absolutely. There's no question I was addicted. You know, I mean, I knew every day <clears throat> I played from 12 o'clock till 4, 4.30. And uh, <clears throat> every excuse I had to go out and go to a club and my wife wasn't aware of it, I would find a way to get out. You know, like I say, I, I, I know I was addicted. Babstock estimates that he dropped more than $75,000 into these machines in less than a decade. And after speaking to large groups about his recovery, he's heard many greater VLT tragedies from audience members. I said, do you mind if I give you a hug? I said, no, oh, okay. <laughs> when she hugged me, she started to cry. And I said to her, I said, are you okay? Her uncle just committed suicide because of the machines. And I know many other cases like that. And I, I don't think the people in government, uh, and obviously I think the court system realizes how much damage these machines are causing. Babstock says he couldn't believe the support he received years ago after he went public about his addiction on CBC's Here and Now. And my son's here and I was on the phone straight away. The first one who called was my wife's father-in-law from her first marriage. And what he said was absolutely amazing. He said, I'm calling to let you know that I'm going to be proud to tell everybody that I know you. And that's all I've ever gotten. Last year, video lottery terminals brought this province a net profit of $130 million. That's a lot of money, but Doug Babstock says the suffering they cause outweighs any benefits they bring. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Concerned parents in Shea Heights are scrambling to stop the pending closure of their daycare center. It's been in the community almost two decades, but a combination of bad breaks could mark the end. Cease Herit reports. It's more than a daycare, according to parents in Shea Heights. They say it's an integral part of their community on the hill, and they're heartbroken with the thought of it closing. Heartbroken enough to start raising money to try to keep it open. We banded together. We have a fantastic group of parents, um, all different. There's teachers, I'm a nurse. There's like, just all a, a span of uh, different professions, and like we've done toll bridge, we've done bottle drives, we've asked for, like we've uh, you know pretty much begged and pleaded for donations. <laughs> When the daycare owner retired almost a year ago, the community got together to make the center a nonprofit. The chair of the board says it's been a struggle ever since, with snowmageddon and now the pandemic hurting attendance. At our return on June 29th, we were down to half capacity of the kids. So a lot of kids didn't return because a lot of parents were either unemployed, didn't need the uh, talk here currently, uh, waiting return to work. And uh, we also had some parents who were just nervous about sending their kids back to a daycare setting. O'Keefe's twins go there. She says the parents have raised almost $6,000, but thousands more are needed to keep the center open. It's a huge loss. And like this place, everyone, even if you go through the community, okay, where am I going to? Well, there's Panda Bear Daycare, there's a store, there's a school. Like it's a landmark in our community. So like, the majority of the people in this community, especially the kids at the school, have all had a part of Panda Bear Daycare. And there's kids that are in high school now, their pictures are still on the board in the room. Hill says quarterly operating grants and delays in government subsidies for children in care haven't helped the situation. So you're going almost six weeks with no payments. And what you, like I said, you still have to maintain. So that system doesn't really work for, for us or uh, you know other daycares that we've talked to is the same issues. The parents say that they will continue to raise money right up until Friday, whatever it takes to get this job done because of the uncertain future, and they want to make sure that this daycare in their community has a future. Cease here, CBC News, Shea Heights. 
Well, three people are dead following an accident this weekend on the Trans-Canada Highway near Appleton. The two vehicle collision happened Saturday just before 8.30 p.m. Both drivers as well as one passenger were killed and the highway was shut down for several hours afterwards. No word on the cause of the crash, but the RCMP continues to investigate. Well, police say more than $50,000 worth of damage was done to construction equipment in Natwashish. According to RCMP, three shipping containers belonging to Dobson Construction were burned out on Thursday. Firefighters were called to the scene around 3 in the morning. Police say the fire was put out quickly, but everything inside the containers was destroyed. Anyone with information is asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. And another fire in Grand Falls, Windsor is giving the community a sense of deja vu. For a third summer, police are investigating a string of unsolved, suspicious fires. The latest blaze burned down a vacant office building on Union Street late last week. This after a building which houses equipment for the town's ski club burned on July 10th. Before that, a dance studio and the former Islander RV building were targeted. The mayor is asking people to keep a lookout and to keep properties well lit and under surveillance to deter any arson. Well, police are also investigating a break and enter at Stephenville Primary School and property damage at Stephenville Elementary. The RCMP says surveillance footage and electronics were stolen from the primary school and the elementary school had a number of its windows smashed. Police suspect the crimes happened sometime between 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon and 8.30 Thursday morning. Well, an old abandoned mill in Corner Brook is about to get a makeover. Representatives from all levels of government, Grenfell and CNA, made the announcement this afternoon. Here in Now's Colleen Connors has more on the new Center for Research and Training. This old white building was built in the 50s, a human resources office for the pulp and paper mill, and will soon be the center of research and innovation, a center with a lot of partners that that innovation and the thought process and the passion is going to be revived again now. And like you said, Dwight, with a little bit of makeup and maybe a bit of Botox and who knows what else, it's going to be looking great again and an icon in the middle of town. <laughs> Close on $9 million is going into this icon. Kruger will maintain the building but lease it rent-free to Memorial University's Grenfell campus. They plan on using the centre in many different capacities, including research into paper mill waste. So the uh, Navigate Entrepreneurship Centre is going to be relocated down here, the maker space with prototyping of new products. Um, again, you know, looking at research, high in research of, of how, you know, we utilize some of the products from the, the mill to reimagine how they're going to uh, impact on the wider society. So it's, it, its future is not told at this point. It has tremendous possibilities. Training possibilities as well. The province is putting in $5 million to support a training program developed and delivered by CNA. This investment is one about sustainability, is one about succession, some 450 jobs attached to this. And so what it is, is working with Kruger, working with Grenfell Memorial, CNA, the city of Cornwall, who has been a, a great partner in all of this, and the federal government, to make sure that this mill, the forestry sector, in a larger part, remains sustainable for the future. So this allows the building to have new life. And certainly uh, as part of that is uh, training for our employees, which is certainly a very important aspect, but also allow the uh, research to occur, which will bring uh, really the key players all together. Pelly says the centre will provide more in-house training for employees, giving the mill a competitive edge. But before any of that can happen, the building needs a major renovation. Now, no one has really used this building at all since 2004. First, it needs to be cleaned out. Secondly, construction needs to begin. And that should happen by the end of this construction season in the fall of the year. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. The world's largest trial for a potential COVID-19 vaccine kicked off today in the United States. 30,000 volunteers are expected to roll up their sleeves to help test whether the vaccine is safe and effective. 
This study, now in its final stage, is one of the first to enter large-scale human trials. Moderna, the American biotech company behind it, received nearly $1 billion in federal funding. Around the world, there are multiple trials underway as global infections top 16.3 million. Well, here at home, no new cases of COVID-19 to report in this province today. There are currently four active cases on the island. With the Atlantic bubble in full swing, some tourism operators say they're still struggling. Back in May, the province pledged $25 million in funding for the industry. But as here and now's Heather Gillis reports, some want added support. Really, we've just had such a devastating year. Jane Kingston is the general manager of the Doubletree by Hilton in St. John's. The hotel is one of half a dozen that shut down during the pandemic. They're finishing a multi-million dollar renovation, something they were hoping to benefit from this summer. But business is slow. In fact, every summer normally we, we see between 72 and 80 motor coach tours pass by our hotel. So the loss there has been so significant, you know, at least 1.5 million, not to mention the loss of our corporate guests. They're seeing few staycationers as most are spending time in more rural areas. There's no Argentia ferry run this year and air access to the province is reduced. But for us, we're not seeing the, the real benefits of the bubble. Jane Kingston, manager of the Doubletree Hotel, says the tourism industry needs more support from government. Whether it be the property taxes being held where they are, which is static right now, or, you know, uh, deferred or different payment plans. Also looking at things like low interest loans. While here, many tourists take tours like whale watching. O'Brien's and Gatherall's boat tours partner to survive the season. They say they're seeing a lot of young families from the Avalon and a few from the bubble. But the pair says this year doesn't compare to the last 30 they've been in operation. A good day in July with sunshine, lots of whales. Between the two companies, you'd have probably six, 700 people a day. We started out thinking we weren't going to get many people, and now we're doing two and three trips a day. But on the northern peninsula, Kerr Knudsen of Dark Tickle Expeditions hasn't put his tour boat in the water in St. Lunaire Gricket. Uh, we felt we would not, not make our money back. He says he's seen few staycationers in his part of the province and even fewer tourists from the Atlantic bubble. 70% of the tourists they right see here. are from Ontario, Quebec, and the United States. So it's kind of a big hole fill, to fill with staycations or the Atlantic bubble. Now he's worried about people who depend on seasonal tourism work and the effects on the workforce for next year. If they haven't got their hours and what, what not, how do they make it through the winter? Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, some frontline workers are being honored with works of art. Local artists are offering free portraits to people who've been stepping up during the pandemic. You can see the portraits for yourself by searching the hashtag FrontlineFacesNL. Here now, Zach Audi takes us in for a closer look. If you look at the history of portraiture in art, a lot of the times the people whose, whose pictures are being done, they are kings and soldiers and rulers. So I think there's something really special about the normal people in our community being able to see themselves in a, in a moment. an avid follower of art on Instagram. Pretty much all I see on Instagram is amazing art from all around the world. And I started to see this one hashtag popping up, uh, hashtag uh, portraits for NHS heroes. Artists would post on Instagram that they were interested in doing a portrait of an NHS health worker. And uh, the artist would uh, connect with a worker, do a portrait, and then actually give that portrait to the worker themselves. And I just thought it was too good. And it sort of seemed like the kind of thing that Newfoundland was made for. We, of course, have a major respect for all the healthcare workers who are out there doing what they're doing. And we wanted to include them, but we also saw that there were other groups of workers who were really coming to the front lines and who were having to do things that the rest of us in our houses weren't doing and we wanted to honor them as well so we actually opened it up and we actually were going with, with the idea of frontline workers so that's a much more encompassing kind of group of people 
And so I talked to artist Rodney Mercer, who has been my art teacher actually and friend. And we decided we wanted to just kind of give it a try here. You know, it's just a thank you, you know, to essential workers. And of course, you know, there are the people we think of in the healthcare system, but there's the people who work in grocery stores. And it just goes on and on and on. And these are the people that are, you know, keeping the ball rolling and they don't get, you know, necessarily get a fair due. So, yeah, I don't mind putting my brush forward and, um, you know, acknowledging these people. What's interesting about this project is that a virtual exhibition is online now. When you search the hashtag not my faces and now you see it there. And it's a permanent record of, um, you know, a very unique moment in our time. I received the nomination for Nathan on Instagram along with like a, this beautiful like picture of him. It was my first time painting someone that I've never met before. So this will be my first time meeting Nathan today when we go in and give it to him, which is exciting. been working really hard through the pandemic. I see him, I've never met him, but I see him as this really kind guy and I hope that that has come across in my painting of him. His work and the work of all essential workers should be recognized and um, there should be gratitude. video. A researcher, Tyler Eddy, caught this underwater video of Capelin swimming off Middle Cove on Thursday. And Ashley Brawlweiler is back. She'll tell us uh, if there's any foggy Capelin weather in the forecast. That's coming up next.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. Welcome back. It's so nice to see you. It's nice to be back, certainly, but we all, uh, it was nice to unplug for a little while. Certainly needed a little bit of vacation there. <laughs> I bet. So how's the forecast looking? Well, uh, it's a little cool today, especially for parts of the east. Plenty of cloud cover in play as well. Let's take a look at those temperatures across the board. Only reaching a high near 17 degrees here in St. John's. Uh, we've got temperatures heading towards uh, the western portion of the island. Much warmer, 25 degrees in Corner Brook this afternoon, 17 in Cartwright. And we've got those temperatures pretty much in the teens and or single digits up through Labrador 8 in Makovic this afternoon. Now temperatures have dropped just a little bit, currently sitting at 15 degrees in St. John's and then temperatures yeah, nearing 20 degrees for our 24 degrees rather for Corner Brook. 16 is the uh, current temperature in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now it is a little bit humid, not nearly uh, as bad as, or not nearly as humid as it will be over the next couple of days, but feeling closer to uh, 19 in St. John's and 26 in Deer Lake. Now we do have a couple of systems in play, an area of low pressure just to the east uh, of the island, and that's bringing some cloud cover mainly to eastern portions. We did see some clearing this afternoon through central, but some showers are popping up along the west coast and some thunderstorms as well for southeastern portions of uh, uh, Labrador and that will generally continue for the next couple of hours. There's those showers there along the west and we'll see those showers and thunderstorms head towards uh, the northern peninsula through the overnight or at least the next couple of hours into the early portion of the evening and then some showers will move in for the west coast and spread across central as we head into the early morning hours. Now temperatures will be anywhere from 10 to as much as 15 degrees uh, overnight tonight. Temperature uh, winds generally light on the west coast and then uh, about 15 to 20 kilometer per hour winds expected in the east. Otherwise, uh, a quiet night for Lab West. Those showers will end and you're going to see a temperature near 9 degrees under partly cloudy skies. Now tomorrow, those showers will continue to spread a little bit further east. We should actually see a mix of sun and cloud for the majority of the island tomorrow, but still going to keep in that chance of some afternoon showers. Pop-up showers will move through fairly quickly if they do develop. And then generally cloudy up through the big land. You'll see some clearing late day through central and then more cloud cover will move in for you in Lab West with some rain as well. So temperatures tomorrow are going to be a little bit warmer, about 18 degrees in St. John's, progressively warmer as you head towards central in the mid to high 20s. Best uh, temperatures will be along the west coast. Corner Brook, you should see a high near 25 degrees tomorrow with plenty of sunshine. But again, some morning drizzle and cloud cover expected uh, along the northeast in that onshore flow. But a mix of sun and cloud should develop in the afternoon. Up through Labrador coastal areas, you're looking at the potential for some showers, temperatures in the teens, and then showers the story again uh, in the morning for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then late day for you in Lab West. Now as we head towards Wednesday, it is looking cloudy with the potential for some showers developing, certainly along the southern portion of the island and then into Thursday as well, looking a little bit unsettled. Temperatures will be a little bit cooler as we head into Wednesday uh, for central and parts of the west coast back down to to the 19, 20 degree mark. And then uh, similar temperatures up through Labrador. Plenty of sunshine for you in Nain with a high near 14 degrees. By Thursday, temperatures will be in the 20s, low 20s, albeit for most of the island. Uh, generally gray day at this point. And it's looking a little bit unsettled as we head through the next couple of days as well. Certainly into at least the first half of the weekend, 19 degrees for your Saturday uh, for eastern areas. For central as well as western Newfoundland, generally gray right into Saturday. Temperatures hovering in and around the 20 degree mark and uh, going to feel a little bit more humid as well as we head through the next couple of days. Uh, for eastern Labrador, cloudy generally through Thursday and then by the time Friday and Saturday rolls around, most of Labrador should see some clearing skies and those temperatures in the 20s by the time the weekend rolls around. Had to share this great shot of a sunset on Terrence Pond. Maya sent us that great shot. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you. Well, it was a, a lovely weekend out on the ocean as well. Calm enough to catch these. 
we've been uh, asking people to send us videos demonstrating how they fill it cod. This video comes to us from Port Union. You can see Jason Sweetland and his father, Bruce, here. They caught their cod off Bonavista. Now we're told it took some convincing to get the pair on camera, but we're glad they weren't too shy in the end. Uh, they sure look like they know what they're doing. And have a look at this. Uh, they'll certainly need some skills uh, to get through a fish the size of this. Melanie Chard sent this uh, picture of her and her giant catch along with that video of the Sweetlands. Quite the cod. Thanks so much for sending it all in. Well, do you have any filleting tricks to show off? Send us a video. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or also on Facebook and Twitter at cbcnl. Some indigenous people in Labrador are asking questions about why the RCMP released the names of some people charged with crimes and not others. 
CBC reviewed news releases between May 1st and July 24th and found that indigenous people seem to be overrepresented among people named in those releases. CBC reviewed 85 news releases published during that time and found that eight were about crimes committed in indigenous communities. Now, seven of those releases named the alleged perpetrator. Now, out of those 85 releases, 77 were about crimes committed elsewhere in the province, and 27 of those named the alleged perpetrator. So when you look at it in percentages, the numbers are pretty striking. 88% of alleged perpetrators in Indigenous communities were named during that time, compared to 26% of non-Indigenous people being named. Now it is a small sample size, but does raise questions about whether Indigenous people are being singled out. And one of the people raising that question on social media is Jody Ashini of Sheshashi Inu First Nation. She joins us now. So Ms. Ashini, what do you make of those numbers? Um, it's a high number. It, it's it's not surprising though. Um, just from what we've seen lately, there's been a lot of names released, and a lot of people are picking up on it too. It's it's not uh, yeah, it's not surprising. Can you talk about some of the consequences of naming people uh, charged with crimes in Indigenous communities? It's, it's big consequences. Everything is on social media lately. And for someone to have their name out there, and I've actually spoken to someone that has talked to the RCMP, and they've actually said, like, I quote, that they don't go back and put in names of the non-Indigenous people. They just don't have the time to go back and put that name in. So obviously if a crime that has, or, or something that's been committed by an, an Indigenous person, their name is already out there. They're not gonna go back and remove the name if they're not going back and putting a name in. So this is stuck with them forever on public, like internet, it's, it's a, if you want a job now, what's the first thing people do? They go and they search your name and what comes up, but a, RCMP headline of what you've did but then it could have went into court and been thrown out and you've never actually been charged or convicted with this but yet the RCMP headline with your name is still up there you think you're going to get the job over someone else it's 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 there's many many different um very big consequences behind just releasing a name it's not just out there people publicly convict you it's even before it's gone into court like they they've already made you already made you guilty so it, it's it's there's big consequences behind this so how did this issue in particular get on your radar why why now why are people talking about this now people are recognizing the injustices now with the black black lives matter movement the indigenous people are kind of coming on to this and being able to say like okay this is what's happening to us also so it's easier to talk about. There's more people, there's more relevance now. The RCMP will say that uh, race does not play a, a role in their decision to uh, identify people charged with crimes, that you know, race isn't a factor, gender isn't a factor, where someone lives isn't a factor. Uh, so what do you think is happening here? I don't know like what their protocols are and like they said that if there's enough public interest they'll look into it I think this is enough public interest I think it's time now they sit back and do the research and figure out okay what's really going on here yeah what kind of action would you like to see from the RCMP on this issue Oh, I'd love to for them to go and go back on their uh, whatever they have now and start doing that research, start seeing if there is an actual injustice done and maybe to get it changed. Maybe there should be a new protocol in place that everybody, if even if it's not sworn in the court right away, I know they use that as a one, but maybe they should wait to release the non-Indigenous names until that's been sworn in the court so that it's equal. I don't know how that the not, the indigenous people get sworn in so quickly releases are released like the they've been arrested two in the morning their name is out there at 9 a.m so how is it that some are sworn in and others aren't is what maybe there should be more behind it i think they need to look into it well jody ashini thank you so much for speaking with me about this today yeah, thank you for having me 
Well, the RCMP does say that if the public is interested in this issue, it will look into whether or not Indigenous people are disproportionately named in news releases. Corporal Jolene Garland says they only release names once the charges have been sworn in court. Race, gender, ethnicity, and locations of crimes being committed are not factored into the release of an individual's name. So the only conclusion to really draw is the RCMP Newfoundland and Labrador releases names of individuals that are under charge once the charge is formally sworn and the information is then public knowledge. That's it's the only conclusion we're able to draw. In an ongoing series we're calling Drawn to It, we're taking a peek inside the artistic process of local creators. Well, tonight the spotlight is on an Inuk artist from Postville. Bronson Jacques says the North Coast is a constant source of inspiration. My name is Bronson Jock. I'm an Inuit artist from Postville on North Coast of Labrador. I focus mainly on oil paintings, um, mostly realism, and I also do drawings, carving, sculpture, as many kinds of things as possible. Um, my pop carves, my uncle carves and draws, my nans, they make clothing, and so I was always encouraged to create stuff myself. I've always, in the back of my head, wanted to just, you know, take the dive and see if I can do my art full time because I was always creating on my spare time. Something that I love to do with my art is showing people a part of where I come from because there's so much up there that a lot of people never get to see. There's so much beauty on the North Coast and that's always something that I wanted to capture in my art. So that's something that really helped me dive into realism is because I wanted to show other people the really nice things that surround us. Whenever I'm painting something, I take it as like an honor to be painting it and I want to do the best job that I can. A lot of times I'll forget to eat because I'm <laughs> painting and I'm just so into it. And that's the days that I really enjoy because I just get lost in the painting for a full day. <laughs> it makes me feel relaxed. It takes away my stress. It takes away any like uh, worries I have because when I'm painting, that's the only thing I have to focus on. I'm working on a painting of my Nan Sadie, who recently passed away. It's a surprise for my mom. She's a, such a smart and kind lady. I, I wanted to do a painting that showed that side of her and not the side that maybe a lot of people remember. She had lung cancer and she's, you know, it was a very long, tiring experience for everybody. I guess that I just focus on capturing a moment or a feeling in my art so it's not just like a, a photograph. I'm trying to make it more of like a, a dreamy scene, kind of like like a memory would feel but still realistic. If you think, of, think back on a memory it might be a bit different than it was really but it's the way that it made you feel that really matters so that's this style that I'm really trying to put into my paintings. So talented. We connected with uh, Bronson Jock at his home in Mount Pearl, but he's since moved to Halifax to study fine arts in the fall. Thanks to videographer Mike Sims and producer Katie Rowe for that piece. We'll have more of that series drawn to it in the coming weeks. Brandon defied medical science by his uh, remarkable recovery. Sometimes I go up to people and tell my story on to drink and drive. You know, five years ago, I got a very bad car crash in Alberta. I, I don't want him to be rejected. I fear for his rejection. I feel badly for him. Brandon has assured me that that rejection does not hurt him. He said, Mom, I got hit by an SUV. There's not a lot that I'm afraid that can hurt me right now. So.
welcome back. In national news, police in Montreal are facing an accusation of racial profiling. A group of young black people who had gathered to play basketball were fined for breaching strict COVID-19 rules. It's what police officers did next that's stirring anger and controversy. CBC's Verity Stevenson has the story. On a hot day in late May, when Quebec was starting to loosen up its rules, Nathan Derry and eight friends met up for a basketball match. They had seen on the news some sports were allowed. Then uh, the police come. They said, uh, we can't play. So it was like, OK, can you talk to us about uh, that was a misunderstanding? They say the officers told them they were done with giving warnings. All nine young black men were given tickets between $500 and $1,500, depending on their age. A total of $11,500 in penalties. We was shocked, but uh, it's not about the money, it's about, it's about discrimination. 30 minutes later, some of them saw a group of white kids playing basketball. Derry says cops approached them too, but didn't give them tickets, only verbal warnings. Derry and his friends reached out to local anti-racism groups and now plan to file complaints with police and possibly Quebec's Human Rights Commission. They say racism in their city goes beyond police profiling. A former RCMP officer helping with their complaints says police here do practice racial profiling. This has been a, an ongoing problem for at least for the last 10 years. Others here want action from local leaders. It's very important that we uh, put on place structures or, uh, or programs that want to help uh, the kids, the community to feel welcome here in uh, Repentigny and to feel that they are home. This mother says she has often thought about moving but won't be pushed out. Things have to change. It's not for us to go away. It's for them to accept the fact that the society is changing. The police say some of the young men had been warned about playing on the court. The men say they weren't and now play elsewhere. Police do say they'll meet with anti-racism activists this week. Verity Stevenson, CBC News, Repentigny, Quebec. Well, there are growing calls across the country to include the experiences of black Canadians in school curriculums. Many believe those experiences need to be woven into content, content for all subjects, not just black history. Deanna Sumanek Johnson reports. Charlene Grant has always taught her children about their history as black Canadians because she says their schools didn't. <laughs> When my child was in grade 10 and she realized <laughs> history class, everything that was being taught did not talk about her. She gave her daughter a plan. This is how you fight that. Every assignment you get, do it on the black experience, what was happening at that time. Half of our black students aren't making the choice to pursue an academic stream in high school. In recent our weeks, black, Ontario got rid of the practice of streaming in high schools, which was found to steer black students away from university track courses. But advocates like Grant demand more change. The curriculum is, is key. In Nova Scotia, there are two African-focused elective courses at a high school level, but this professor says that's not enough. When we're in science, we should be talking about black scientists. When we're in math, why aren't we talking about black contributions to math? So. Often, even when black subjects are being taught, they're ghettoized into black history. The push to make the black Canadian experience a more central part of the curriculum isn't new. But many feel that right now, the focus on fighting systemic racism might mean something will come of it. Make this, if you will, a teachable moment, how we can strengthen the uh, curriculum ties. BC's uh, Minister of Education has been consulting with black history organizations. I want to believe in their honesty. And I want to believe that they truly want to make a change because we want to live in a society that is fair for all of us. And Charlene Grant thinks now is the time too. Her oldest son is off to university, but her youngest still has lots of years left in the public school system. I want my children to have a better a better, um, a better future, a better chance. It's one of the reasons why I go, because I'm hopeful. Hopeful that a day is close when students of all backgrounds will learn about black history as a part of learning about Canada. Deanna Slimanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto.
Welcome back. The world's longest running soap opera is back with new episodes. Coronation Street is arguably one of the most famous streets in Britain, even if it is a work of fiction with many, many fans in this province. Now, Corey couldn't overcome the challenges of filming during a pandemic, but now the cast has returned to a fictional world touched by real life. Here's Renee Filipponi. For fans, so much remains familiar. But now, for the first time, with hand sanitizer and health signs decorating the set, the reality of COVID has come to fictional Weatherfield. Whoa, 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 keep your distance now. The beloved characters, like everyone else, have been forced to adapt. It's one of the very, very rare occasions where we actually cross over into the reality of the world we live in as opposed to the reality we create in Coronation Street. No. After 60 years, it's the longest running soap in the world, but the pandemic suddenly presents a new challenge. The Queen has visited the set and is believed to tune in herself. The producers say there was pressure to get this right. There is one story which um, focuses around a character of ours that works in a healthcare setting that will be, uh, you know, that will more directly deal with coronavirus and the impact that has on people and on, you know, health workers and, and their families. The need for social distancing is a big concern. Filming resumed in June after being shut down for months. There are strict protocols on set with limited crew and no touching. The staple of a good soap episode is a, is a, is a punch up or a fight. Can't do that either at the moment. Neither can you. Creative editing and dummies are used to make it work. And romantic moments like weddings are a real challenge. You may now kiss the bride moment. We played that mostly off audience reactions. So, you know, tearful people in the congregation. For safety reasons, actors over 70 aren't returning to set yet. Thanks. But for those who are acting at a distance, leave some second guessing their instincts. Should I move or should I not move? I and mean, then you do feel quite like stationary at the moment because you know that you can't really roam around the set like, like you like you would do as an actor. Yeah, but that's the point. She's always singing about everyone else. Yeah, well, that's a moment, isn't it? For Ryan she Russell's character, the Michael, the, the anxiety of COVID gets real right away. His character's mother is a nurse working on the front line. I'm worried about her. She's working so hard. She's doing so many shifts. And while the pandemic has come to the soap, the classic dramatic storylines stay on course. But now, life on fictional Coronation Street looks a lot more real. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, staying in the UK, in an unusual reversal of traditional roles, a mountain rescue team was called in to extricate a St. Bernard from the highest peak in England. Yeah, it's a bit it's rotten, so. Daisy ran into difficulty on the descent from the summit on Friday. Her owner said her back legs seized and she refused to move. So the rescue squad swooped in, strapped the compliant victim to a stretcher and headed down. St. Bernard's, usually used as guard dogs in the Alps, became famous for saving travelers who lost their way in the snow and mist. Following her rescue, Daisy spent the night in a deep sleep, reportedly snoring a little louder than usual. Well, that wraps up this edition of Here and Now. Uh, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. I hope you can join us again tomorrow night. Good night.